this morning, my brothers and my sisters, out of the Gospel of Luke, that 19th chapter, as Dr. Reeves read the first 10 verses of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, where it talks about Jesus entering Jericho and passing through. And it says a man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. King James Version calls him a publican, a public civil servant, and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short. So he ran ahead, climbed the sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be a guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, today, somebody say today. today. Salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. Just for the next few moments, I want to tell you, this is the Lord's moment for you. This is the Lord's moment for you. Because Zacchaeus stood there and said, Lord, half of everything I have, I'll give it to the poor. If I cheated anyone, I'll give it back four times as much. But Jesus said to him, today, salvation has come to your house because you are a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek out and to save the lost. My brothers and my sisters, within the last week, depending what planet you found yourself on, there was no way to avoid the public demonstrations and demonization of the impeachment process. Within the last few weeks, we've heard the partisan voices of Democrats and Republicans both build their cases for or against what the facts are building toward. I highlight this because we have seen and heard elected officials, public employees, rail against a system that many have benefited from as a document that expressly begins with, we the people. One that gives certain rights and privileges dealing with certain freedoms of speech, religion, expression, despite the darkness and the intent at the time it was written toward exclusion. We come to understand that those who are elected, selected, and appointed work for a system that does require checks and balances. That the United States government established an executive branch, a legislative branch, two houses of Congress, and a judicial branch to ensure that no one area had more power than the other Therefore, it could not go unchecked. And what we've seen over the last three years, abuses of power, cover-ups that this generation and beyond will read about in its history books, is something that when public officials who live among the people like those in our congressional district, their municipality walk among us, and in some instances have one persona in the community. But we also know that there's one that 
goes behind locked doors. It's something when we know that these things go on. Corruption, kickbacks, big rigging, and tax dollars spent for lifestyles when there are resources that are needed for the schools and public works. It makes people angry. And that many times we lump all the people into one pot and say they are all bad or have sold their souls to get ahead. There we say that for many there are no redeemable qualities that any possess for the halls of Congress, the city halls and municipalities. And the truth is even from the pulpit to the pews. We may have been scarred by experiences that have clouded our judgment and made us cynical to the point where we don't want to participate in the process. And we check out to pursue an ultra-spirituality that means none of this stuff matters. But today I want to appeal to you not to give up on the process because Christ as the Redeemer is the one that redeems all because it's by God's grace, the radical unmerited favor that Christ came to impart to all creation that allows us to stand. We stand beyond our political affiliations and we most certainly stand beyond our religious judgments because the Son of Man, which is a synonym for humankind, is the righteous judge who came to seek and to save the lost. It's Jesus who illustrates God's preeminent grace, the grace that comes before any human response to God in justification or conversion, giving us the opportunity to be called the children of God. God is Jesus who calls and demonstrates that all are able to receive repentance of sin. In our text this morning, the account of Jesus and Zacchaeus and Jericho, which is found only in Luke, recalls the immediately preceding story of a blind beggar that in the story before it, the beggar is poor and in our text today, Zacchaeus is rich, yet both are blessed with the same salvation, which is God's activity to bring humans into a relationship that is positive with God and one another through Jesus Christ. In our text, Jesus has entered Jericho, the city that is east of Jerusalem, where he's going to be crucified. And at first glance, one might think that this is a minor interruption in the mission of Jesus, but there's a purpose to what's going on in the text. The text says a man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, listen now, the crowd, he could not. And because he was also short in stature. And as I mentioned, the King James uses the word publican, which is a person that collected the taxes for the Roman Empire. And as a chief tax collector, the text implies or implicates deeply into a corrupt tax system of the government, where in a corrupt system, the loftier one's position, the higher you rose, the greater your complexity in the system itself. The Roman tax system was one where the people were pushed to the brink of bankruptcy to support a system where they had no representation. While we don't know much about the private life of Zacchaeus, no one can be privately righteous while participating 
in and profiting from a program that robs and crushes other people. Nobody can get ahead in systems that are corrupt and take from the poor people of its land without getting themselves muddy and dirty with the corruption they find themselves in. Then the job that Zacchaeus had differs from what we know of the role of a tax collector or IRS agent today. In our context, we file tax returns based upon our income and the regulations and the codes of our country or our state along with federal requirements. It's under the best of intentions that people choose the careers they have and the lines of their personal integrity can be pushed, but they still hold to strict codes and guidelines to do what's right. In the case of the text, though, they got some feelings about tax collectors because they are seen as traitors to the heritage and the culture of their own people. It's the Roman government that conquered their homeland and put people out of where they lived and drove them out of their livelihoods and took away most of what they had. And they put in place people that looked like them, people that grew up around them, people that lived as their neighbors. They put in charge of them to collect their taxes and there were those that took advantage of other people. Imagine my brothers and my sisters, how many times we see those that represent us look like us and we stand in the voting booth, we just go down one line. But when they get behind the closed doors, our interests are out the window for the needs of special interests, big money donors, and those that control them like puppets. I can imagine that's why Jesus in Matthew 7 verse 6 says, don't give away what is holy to dogs and don't throw your pearls before swine because they'll trample them underfoot and maul you. In a socially relevant context, when we give what we conceive as precious or set on part away cheaply, there are those that will feast on it, they will take what we have, and they will never give anything back. And so it's Zacchaeus that has a cultural crisis. Yet he also exhibits a radical faith toward Redemption. This short man displays an unusual measure of faith when it says in verse 4, he climbed a sycamore tree to see Jesus because he knew he was going to pass that way. His intense desire to see Jesus overcomes the ridicule and the embarrassment of the crowd that's around him. It's fundamental to the happy conclusion of the story that this man exhibits something in spite of his social standing of what other people might say about him. In our journey with Jesus, we've got to be willing to go beyond the voices of the crowd and those that may know our story or our personal history and don't deem us worthy. We've got to be willing to stretch out ourselves by faith in order to see Jesus as he goes our way. All right. All right. One thing that this teaches us is that faith requires radical steps not to impress Jesus, but to demonstrate that we are willing to go beyond the conventional prescriptions of others to receive what the Lord has for us. My brothers and my sisters, in your faith journey, what have you allowed to stop you 
from getting a glimpse of God's salvation, God's act of saving for your life? Is it disbelief on the faces of the crowd or the mocking of those that know your story? Dare we say Jesus looks beyond the crowd and the stature of Zacchaeus and calls him to come? Jesus looks beyond what you used to be and what you used to do. Jesus looks beyond your social circumstances, your failings and your weaknesses in order to see you for who you are and he bids you come here. All right. All right. Calls him to come. But the Bible says before Zacchaeus could see Jesus, Jesus saw him first. That's an example of God's grace. Before you and I knew who we were, the Lord had already seen us. The Lord saw past the shame we felt in trying to do our best. The Lord saw past our limitations and our inadequacies before we were formed in our mother's womb. God had already given us the grace that looked beyond our faults and saw our needs. That's why John Newton called it amazing grace. Amazing grace, a sound that makes us come to the one that knows all about us, who formed us and shaped us, knew when we were false knew when we would fall and saw us where we were and told us now is your moment come the Lord saw him and said come down called him by name told him come down and said I've got to stay at your house today it's in this moment that it can wash away a lifetime of ridicule, a lifetime of shame and doubt. It's called a Kairos moment, K-A-I-R-O-S. It's a Greek word for the term time, which denotes a special, significantly critical point in human history when God's will and purposes are carried out. We understand it in the coming of Jesus Christ into the world, but God also has special or significant moments in our lives. It's God that knew us before we knew ourselves. It's God that knew us before we made the mistakes we made, but it's also God that showed up in our depravity and in our despair, and God revealed God's goodness and God's mercy to us. That's why when the psalmist in the 23rd said, surely goodness and mercy will follow me, he understood that God's moment is always there in our time, of struggle in our time, but he is God's moment, that God reveals God's self and brings us out of whatever God's moment, which is also our moment, because you see, he chose Zacchaeus for this time. But listen to what happens. The crowd, in the seventh verse says, he's gone to be a guest of sinners. Isn't it funny? Folks see what God is doing with you and all they can ever remember is what you were. Talk about being in recovery. Going through all the steps, trying to do your best. And every time you get around family, they start hiding everything from you. Start treating you like you still got that itch or that yearning. Folk don't forget what you were. They, you know the sad thing is we don't forget one another's failures. But we sure don't have a problem bringing them up when it's opportune for ourselves. But this isn't the first time Jesus has heard this accusation. In Luke chapter 5 verses 27 to 32, he goes and he eats with Levi, another tax collector. 
They make the same statements. And in that moment, Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, he says, I've come not to call the righteous, those that think they got it all together, everything, a bag of chips, but I've come to call sinners to repentance. It is those that are in need of salvation that Jesus comes to. I don't know about you, but the same judgment we pass on folk, which is not our business, but the Lord who is the one that vindicates and redeems is what is keeping some of us from realizing what God has right in front of our face. We spend our time bogged down in the righteousness of our own interpretation of what is right and what is wrong with somebody else. But I'm glad this morning that Jesus who seeks out those that have fallen is the only one that can pick us up and present us often before God. Every single that points at what he's done has four others pointing back at what they did. But I'm glad this morning the one that knows all about our faith and also the one that is righteous and either forgive us and to wash us and make us clean. That's why when we come to the Lord's table, we don't trust in the ability of the crowd, nor do we trust in our own ability, but we trust in the God who made us new. We trust in God's grace that allows us to come because it's God's moment. It's God's moment that we come free. Things I, I got for you to let you know that it's the Lord's moment for you that will connect with what God has done for us. The first thing is we've got to understand that our salvation is not dependent on our work. The Bible says in verse 8, Zacchaeus stood there and said, Lord, half my possessions I'll give to the poor. If I cheated anybody of anything, I'll pay it back. Four times as much. You see, Zacchaeus had extended hospitality to Jesus. And as a result of their meeting, he goes beyond the law's requirements for restitution. Voluntary restitution called for the, a return of the original amount plus 20% on top of it. About anything which was sworn falsely, he would store anything that was taken by uh, deceptive means. One would give it back in abundance, above and beyond what they took. That it was required by the law that you would give back 20%. Now for those of us who don't tip, when we go to a restaurant, we take the number and we multiply it by 0.20. And that gives us what our tip is. You see, my brothers and my sisters, all he was to do was give a 20% tip. But he said, what I will do is I will give back double and triple and quadruple anything that was taken that wasn't mine. If anybody has anything to say, I'll give it back and make sure it's done beyond what was asked for. Contemporary restitution called for doubling the original amount and in some cases paying it back four and five fold. He tries to make restitution by earning forgiveness. As we studied in the Articles of Religion, According to Methodism, Article 9 says we are counted righteous before God only for the merit, the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by faith and not by our own works or deserving. This is an expression of the radicality, the radical grace of God on the part of Zacchaeus. But it's by the power of the good news of Jesus Christ that moves sinners toward discipleship. Repentance by being saved is not a transaction where we exchange our good and our bad on a marketplace, but it's a transformation of a heart that leads us to do good work for Jesus Christ that will bear fruit. We cannot buy our salvation. We 
cannot trade our salvation. We cannot be made white. But in God's own time, God sent God's only son to save us and to deliver us. It's by his word and not our own. Our salvation is not dependent on our work. Our work is a result of our salvation. That means once I know that I know what Jesus has done for me, there must be a fruit that is bad, which is love and joy and peace and righteousness and mercy that is a visible sign of God's grace. Second thing, salvation is a radical expression that defies conventional conventional norms. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man is a child of Abraham. The work of Jesus in the text takes on something that is unfamiliar to those that have always done it a particular way. You see in the appeal to give back more than what has been gained. Salvation takes on a form that turns the world upside down. God's work of grace goes beyond what we have judged to be normal because it extends to those that have been deemed abnormal. The word abnormal is one that often has a negative connotation because by definition it means deviating from what is normal or usual, typically in a way that is undesirable or worthy. The crowd indicted this man because they knew certain things about him that caused them contention and frustration. The text doesn't speak about any sacrifices or situations that drove him to his chosen occupation, nor does it give an indication why he sought to see Jesus. If I could use my imagination, it doesn't say anything about him more than what we know that he was a short man. It doesn't talk about his marital status, whether he was living with somebody who wasn't his wife. It doesn't talk about his sexual identification or orientation. All that we know is that this man was short, he had a good job, but he had an urgent need to see Jesus. Had a need to see Jesus. Despite the position he found himself in both physically and metaphorically. There are people around us that we don't think deserve God's grace until they change or conform to our standard of what is normal. When we speak about the church, that's why we cannot see it as an institution a business or a hospital because one is concerned with painting and, and, and making sure its position and its structure is sound and in place while the others are concerned with shareholder value and return. A business or a hospital in this day and age is concerned with dividends and profit margins but the Lord's church that goes beyond what is conventional or what we deem normal is one that welcomes all people because it is the household of God purchased and maintained by the Lord's love and the Lord's grace. The Lord is the one that goes beyond what is normal when he extends a new hospitality to the one that lived in the margins of society and went to his home because he was more than what others say he would be. He was more than what his position did he would be. He was more than what the institution had labeled him as. He said, this man is one who is an inheritor of what God has for him. He's one who is a child of Abraham. One 
who knew God for himself, one who walked with God, and God called him a friend. He's an inheritor, therefore he knew. He's new. It's not normal to go and pray in school for the success of the teachers and the students, but we still need to do it. It's not normal to go into City Hall and stand and pray before you walk in. Some of us, it's not normal to pray in our own homes. But God's grace calls for us to do what is radical, what others do not expect. When we live and we identify as God's children, then we've got a responsibility to the inheritance that God has given us in order for us to do what others will not do because we know what God has done for us. God redeemed us from the hand of the enemy. God saved us by God's grace. Therefore, we've got to go beyond what others have said is normal. We've got to love those who might wear mascara and identify as a woman, although they were born as a man. We've got to love those who might have track marks up and down their arms, but they're still somebody's son and somebody's daughter. We've got to love those who might have addictions and social anxiety because they are fearfully and wonderfully made by the God of the universe, the same God that made you with all your faults and imperfections. It's the same God that made you know that we want to go away like God. But I got news for you. If God had thrown us away, there wouldn't have been a need for Jesus. I'm glad to story that God gave us Jesus. that defies conventional norms. In the last one, the role of redemption is the mission of Jesus Christ and not ours. We don't co-opt or take over the mission of Jesus, but we participate in that mission. For he said in verse 10, for the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. Too often, I mean, the church that is an institution made up of congregations that seek to serve themselves wants to gain or redeem people based upon a set of terms and conditions that they set forth. That's why on the back of your program there's a definition of terms. If you look up the definition of a member, allegiance has changed from institution to institution. That means you get mad over here, you run over there. That means you don't like who's here, you're going to go wake them out, Reverend Jackie. But when you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you realize that the mission is not yours or mine, but we participate with Jesus Christ in co-mission. See, redemption is a financial metaphor that means buying back, which is used to indicate atonement. Where we get confused is thinking that people of God owe an allegiance to a particular person people or group because of what has been done. However, redemption is the call of Christ to become Christ centered. Definitions on the back of the bulletin. That's where the church understands and knows it participates in the work and mission of Jesus Christ not as an option, but as a mandate. 
Not as an option to tell somebody about Jesus, but as a mandate to know I've got to run and tell everybody about Jesus. Not as an option to do missions because I feel like it today, but as mandatory because you know there are those in need who God has placed that we are called to see about. Redemption and being Christ-centered is to be reconciled and liberated from sin and bondage and death because of what Jesus has done. It's imperative that we understand that what Jesus has done supersedes any actions we could have done on our own, whether it's our mission or mindfulness of people's condition, Christ is the one that has the central world that we're called to. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we're called to be witnesses. As the disciples of Jesus Christ, we're called to care about me. That's why Jesus said, I didn't come just for those that didn't have a need but had wealth. But I've cared for those that others have lost. But now I found I've cared for the one that was lost. Even though I had 99, Jesus' moment in your life is now. It's now that he calls us by name. It's now that the Lord has a moment for you that goes beyond your limitations and what others have said you'd never be. That's why I'm glad Eugene Williams, an African-American songwriter penned in 1937, I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And with a little light from heaven filled my soul. It bathed my heart in love and wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus makes me whole. That's the Lord's moment for you. The Lord saw you where you were, called you by name. That's the Lord's moment for you. It's not on your goodness, but on the work that he's done. The Lord's moment for you is not dependent on who you are or what you have, but it's about who you are, precious, in the sight of God. This is the Lord's moment for you, the Lord's time in your life, the Lord's time that your dungeon shake and your chains fall off, and you can sing a song that the angels cannot utter. I've been redeemed. I've been bought with a price. Jesus has changed my whole life. This is the Lord's moment for you. Are you ready? Yes. Are you walking? Or will you get bogged down by the crowd? Are you ready? Will you receive it? Or you will worry whether or not you're good enough? The truth is, none of us can ever be good enough for the kingdom of God. That's why God sent his only son, Jesus Christ. As we stand on the church right now, there may be somebody here today.